We're about to get onto the freeway. LA, the city of angels, palm trees, sun, and beautiful people. But there's another side to this city. There are places the tourists should never go. Places even locals try to avoid. This is Skid Row, a place referred to as America's only third world city. It's home to hundreds of homeless people, many of whom are mentally ill or impaired. We'd been warned, but nothing prepared us for what we saw as we cruised the streets leading to the heart of Skid Row. We've filmed in plenty of places, but we were surprised how bleak and frightening this place is. Film crews aren't welcome here, and none of us wanted to get out of the van. And turn that and turn that Our first destination was the Union Rescue Mission. It's the largest and oldest organisation in the USA working to support homeless people. It was started by the founder of Union Oil, Lyman Stewart, 118 years ago. Skid Row in LA, which is really like one of the worst human disasters uh, in the US, and it's really been caused by uh, corralling and containment of people who are struggling with homelessness. 30% of homeless people in the US have some form of mental illness. If you're poor and mentally ill, you have few options before you hit the streets or jail. And you never know which came first. Sometimes the mental illness comes and leads to homelessness, but certainly prolonged homelessness and suffering devastation on the streets, being robbed and beaten and mugged, and if you're a woman, much worse certainly leads to depression and other uh, issues of mental health. Um, so we, we've got to make sure that we don't leave one precious human being on the streets. That's really the bottom line. It sure is easy pushing it downhill, huh? Andy takes us to what feels like a disaster zone. He makes regular trips here, handing out water. He's insisted on bringing eight minders along to make sure our cameras don't upset people but I wasn't prepared for the barrage of people coming up to us. Hey, what's up, United what? States Marine Corps? My name is Lunatic. I'm on St. Julian right there. there. We live, y'all. According to the 2007 statistics, up to 142,000 men, women and children become homeless over the course of any year. Up to 74,000 people are homeless each night in Los Angeles County. Half the homeless are single men, 25% are single women, and the rest are entire families. We are, we are the capital of homelessness. We have more people on the streets in LA than any other city, uh, double of what New York and Chicago have combined. Every suburb, every region, every city has kind of dropped off their folks who were struggling in this spot in L.A. and forgot about them. We're not living up to being the city of angels, and we've got to, we've got to work toward the day when we, we don't have one precious human being on the streets, and that's going to take a lot of work, but mostly it's going to take a heart change. How you going? What sort of feeling does this give you, Andy? Uh, just encouraging to give folks a uh, Cold drink of water and a little bit of encouragement, some hope. Because, I mean, to get through the day for you, I mean, you see a lot of sadness. I mean, does this just add to, does this get you through, doing you know, stuff like this? <clears throat> yeah, it helps. But what really helps is when somebody, when somebody gets a bottle, when somebody gets a bottle of water and then they, uh, they decide later on because they know where the water came from, they come in and ask for real help. When you go take a vacation, Andy once spent a night out on the street just to see what it was like. I think I slept like 30 minutes because a guy said he watched my back, you know, and I yeah. took a little nap, but that's all I got. A friend of mine who spent 20 years said, Andy, after six or seven days, that fear would have been replaced by anger and you would have adapted because humans adapt to anything. We realize they're precious people. Uh, they're somebody's 
aunt, there's somebody's uncle, there's somebody's precious baby that they held in their arms, and, and we need to quit uh, referring to people as the homeless or the drug addicted. It's hot, a dry, searing kind of heat. We've only come about maybe 50 metres. We've handed out over 200 bottles of water. It's gone. We experienced a tsunami of families uh, in this latest economic downturn, and about 53% of the families who came our way uh, were experiencing homelessness for the first time in their life. They lost their home, uh, they lost their job, they lost their apartment, uh, they ran out of funds, they, they ended up in a hotel until their savings is gone, then they moved to their car, and then the last stop was place like Union Rescue Mission. And we've relaunched uh, probably about 45 families, including I think three are getting relaunched this week because we didn't leave them in homelessness long enough to suffer the devastation of homelessness. Yeah. You would not have wanted to visit here before the Safer Cities Initiative. You couldn't. I couldn't walk down the street without having to break up a serious pipe fight or knife fight. Um, it, it was it was described as Mardi Gras on crack, right. and it was very dangerous. And now you can see we can walk down the street yeah. pretty safely, and yeah. without the police, we, we couldn't do that. Yeah. This is um, our day room for our male um, folks who come in and are staying with us. And they can come in and just have some quiet time just to get off the mean streets uh, down here on Skid Row. People can sign up for beds, enjoy three meals a day, and take what might be their first shower in weeks. Good morning, sweetie. How are you? Haircuts are provided, Good. along with fresh clothes and medical yeah. care. Therapists are on hand to assess the mental state of those who turn up here and work out an action plan. The Union Rescue Mission provides a real opportunity to get off the street and start a new life. This wall is the wall where when folks come in and they're sick and tired of being sick and tired and um, of being on the street and they want some help, they sit in these seats for uh, about 14 days. That lets us know that they're really serious about getting some help. It's full every night. Uh, this place holds, I think, about 160 single women. And um, we're full, we're overflowing. Uh, and so we put out cots in the area downstairs where I showed you the day room for the women as well as the men. That's our overflow. So how, how long, essentially, would somebody stay here? Normally, it would be a month. And then after a month, you have to either try and get in one of our programs, um, you know, to try and get off the street, or um, just go away and I guess stay somewhere else. And but because we've had to break the bend the rules a bit, because we really have nowhere to send anybody, so we've had to let them stay a little, a lot more than one mm. month. There's like 160 odd beds here, and um, as you can see, most of them are made, which means that somebody's coming back for the night. There's very few that aren't made. This place is full. And uh, overflowing. Yeah. The question going around in my head is why are all these people here? For many, the bottom has fallen out of their life. But a whole lot of people living here are mentally ill. Hospitals have even dumped unwanted mentally ill patients here on the street. Actually, I was standing out front and a, a cab pulled up, did a U-turn, dropped a woman in a nightgown in the middle of the street, and she started wandering this way. And I called the police and sent a staff person to rescue the lady off the street. We had a videotape of that from our cameras and that played all around the world. And it was the first time it had been documented that hospitals actually drop off patients. She was from 20 miles away. So they dropped this woman off in her hospital gown in the meanest streets of Skid Row. She had dementia, she had a, a high blood pressure and a fever. 
And if we wouldn't have seen them drop her, we wouldn't have rescued her. She'd have been on these streets. And the hospitals were fined, and they set up a protocol. My wife and I set up a special referral sheet that they get properly referred. And can we or can we not take care of the needs of that patient, yes or no, and set up a system. But then we found a, a uh, man wandering around out here who had nine prescriptions for antipsychotic medicine. And he'd been dropped off by a mental hospital 40 miles away. And the city attorney looked into it and found that 155 mental patients had been dropped off on Serious? these mean streets in 22 months. And they were fined $1.6 million. And now there's a city law banning the dumping of patients in Skid Row, LA, and South LA. And that's the thing, doctors are sworn to do no harm and yet hospitals were dropping the most vulnerable people in our society off on these meanest streets, really, in the, in the country. Sharon Cameron was homeless for nearly 25 years and has struggled with mental illness and drug addiction most of her life. I would just grab anything to just make what I was feeling go away. So, it's, and then your body is burnt out. You, well, I used to, my slogan was I felt like I was dip cooked and fried. The only thing left was to toss me to the side. You used to sleep here? Yeah, I used to sleep here. If you notice, people still sleep here. All back here. Uh, because it was safe, you know, it was not too light and not too dark. And you know, you can kind of peek up and see what's going on. And it was warm? No, it was cold. In the summertime, it's okay, but it was hard. You know. So what did you sleep on cardboard or something? Um, no, um, we had um, in the rain. You know, put the cardboard up. But see, they don't allow the, this is a public library. When you're laying here, what are you thinking? Is this this is the worst thing in the world or what? Actually, I didn't have no thoughts. I just stared at the sky. See, I was not only homeless. I was I was gone mentally, and only I didn't. It was. You know, just, just existence, you know, just bought up in the night existence. Worry about who's gonna hurt me, of course, and who's gonna, you know, men take advantage of um, women. When you wake, when you first you pass out, I passed out, I, like I said, I go to sleep. I passed out, and when I, I just came to, can you imagine? And, and you know, sometimes I didn't really know where I was. Um, I didn't, it, oh. God, it's a, it's it's a it's an indescribable feeling. It's just like, you know, that's when you go in off into a depression deeper and deeper and deeper, and you just wish you never wake up. You know, of course, the suicide comes with that, and I just kept trying and I kept trying, so I was just got disgusted. I said, I can't live and I can't die, so I existed. So how long did this last for? How long were you on the streets for? This lasted almost twenty or thirty years, off and on. Just. To get a bit of background, you, you're you're one of nine children. That must have been tough growing up. Yes, I have um, um, three older, three older than me. My older sister committed suicide at 25. I was really jealous because she succeeded, but not no more. Um, then my brother, he's in Seattle. He's doing well, and then my sister Deborah. I'm I'm trying to help her. That's the one that's sleeping on 65th and Western, and mm. it's really bad. Um, and then come uh, me, but and then five little boys up under me, and they all have different fathers. So that lets you know that environment with those men, these men coming in. You know what I'm saying? I love my mom. She was young. And no, I don't. Yeah, I'm not the one that you know talk about my. She was young and she made a lot of mistakes. Trouble started for you pretty early. When, when were you diagnosed? But I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong because everybody be smiling and. I didn't get that, you know. It didn't look like the sun was shining to me. It hurt my stomach. When was the moment when you said, I can't do this anymore. I've got to do something about this. I'm, I got you know, it. I'm 50 years old now, you know? I went downtown and I just took all 60 of those pills and I said a prayer. I never forgot to pray though, never. Mm. I'm talking to the cell phone, <laughs> it didn't even work. Lord, where are you? Please come help me. <laughs> so. Um, I took the pills and I prayed and do you know I just froze? I didn't even go to sleep. So 
that's when I realized, you know, this is, I can't live and I can't die. That part I knew clear. That's about the only thing that made any sense to me. I kept thinking, this man up here got a plan for me. Because I really don't want to be here and I don't know how to live. It's a cold, that's a cold situation there. So that's when I went to um, the Excelsior House. It's a great place, too. I love this, these programs. You can spot them, can't you? So many people are needing help that counsellors struggle to reach them all. Sharon needed to take the first step. This room, you got all the fairy lights, huh? Yes, every day is Christmas to me now. I love this place called Earth. I never thought that I would say this. Look, everything is very peaceful. Sharon's been off the streets for just a year. She now works as a peer advocate for the treatment centre that saved her. Every day for you now is like, you know, you, you, you wake up and it's, oh, I'm just it's a ready. new day. Yeah, I'm just ready to, to help someone. See, as I climb, I lift. I got to make sure I have something in my hand. And my doctor and my therapist told me, don't overdo it. But uh, he, he got me. Yeah. Yeah. Now Sharon's eagerly helping as many other homeless people as she can. She has a spare bed set up for the homeless people she picks up off the street. This is Jesus carrying me. If you notice, he's carrying me through the storm, the rain, the quicksand. I mean, there's every, every, you see it, you see it yourself. Right. It, it is what it is. Look at that. Beautiful. Do you know I have a problem with, this is why I'm afraid now for me, because I feel like I don't deserve anything. Every time I would do good, and then I'll make sure I kick myself down. And I'm really aware of that now, so I'm really watching myself now, and I'm talking about it to everybody that will listen and have that feeling in their heart. This is your sister? Yeah, that's my sister, and this is me. And she lives on the She's street. about eight, yeah. I would like for you to see her. Maybe she can, maybe. Maybe we can go today and see her. I would, I sure hope so. I really need help with her, but I'm doing, yeah. So you can really see what's going on. It's, what is going on with her? She's she's, um, she's delusional. Sick. She's sick physically, mentally, um, substance. She's just broken. She's another me. How I was. Really? Yeah, and I'm trying to take some of this stuff, these tools I have, and I'm trying to spread them all over the world now. And she just happened to be my blood. But I just want to share the gift of life with someone else. Oh, I like that. Somewhere out on these streets is Sharon's sister, Debbie or Angel, as she's known on the street. She's lost in the city of angels. How ironic is that? We decided to try to find her. We head south of downtown LA to an area most people will have seen on the news. But there are a few good news stories out of South Central LA. Every other corner, you see a liquor store or a church. Yeah. And that's only in this in the, um, in the black neighborhood. Right. And they sell Cisco wine. It's a really cheap wine. Yeah. That um, cause you you drunk real quick and yeah. sick. No. Sharon no, is a success, no. but hers is a rare success story. It's all too easy for people to virtually disappear into the vastness of the city. We're getting close to where we are. Sixtieth. Uh, I think that's where Deborah sleeps back there. Oh, the trash. Sixtieth Street. Yeah, that's where she sleeps back there. My, my, my mother died when I was 21, and I had the 13, 14, 15 year old kids to raise. Yeah. Where was Debbie at that time? Deborah was already messed up. She was um. From the age of, see, Deborah was abused really bad. I was, I was sleeping under the bed when Deborah was being raped. I was like seven and she, I mean, I was like five and she was seven. Yeah. So that's another reason why I'm so determined to help her because I know what happened to her. Yeah. I saw it happen. And then she'd tell somebody and then my mother say, what goes on in the house stays in the house. So I said, I didn't see anything. She'd go, can you imagine all that? piling up on her inside yep. as a little bitty girl. Oh, shit. I can ask her. Hi, have you seen Angel? You haven't seen her? All right. 
She also sleeps in Compton, too. Yeah? Yeah. How does, she, how does she get there? Uh-huh. How, how would she get there? Um, Panhandle. See, last time I picked her up, she was um, on that porch right there asleep in, in the rain. As we search for Angel, we come across one of Sharon's friends still living on the street. If it'll help somebody, we're trying to get some help off. No, we just get down on the floor. All right. She's nervous of the camera and refuses to talk to us. Sure. You got any uh, I don't have no money in my pocket. Okay. Just meters down the road, a newly doing? homeless guy. Good. You still homeless? There are people yes. in need Thank everywhere. Chris. Curtis, nice to meet you, bro. How are you? Good, Curtis. So, um, this is home right now. Yes, this is my uh, my bed and my clothes underneath that. Yeah, this is this is my home. Yeah. We'll put you into this situation. Um, I think financial uh, reasons, uh, not enough money um, to afford all that uh, uh, commodities and stuff. I think it was a financial reason. Yeah. Yes. And who's helping? Uh, right now? Yeah. Uh, well, I um, I, uh, I wait for uh, public assistance, and uh, I just live on whatever I can get out here. There's some other homeless people right there. Yeah, she always, they fight over blankets. Que paso? How you seen Angel? No. Who were y'all? Why y'all watching me? I was looking for Angel. I was looking for Angel. Angel in jail. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Why you looking for Angel? You don't know Angel's in jail? No, that's my sister. You talking about skinny Angel? Yeah. She in jail? All right. Wow. Yeah, she got popped when they raided the house down the street. What was she doing? Smoking crack? No, she bought something for an undercover police officer. Oh, God, she's gone to jail. She gone. Um, so not so good news? No, you know, I don't really know how to digest that. But one thing I know for sure is that she has a second chance. Sometimes you don't get arrested, you get rescued. So what Angel's doing? story is typical. In and out of jail, on and off the streets, and a mental illness and drug addiction to boot. But unlike Sharon, Angel is not ready to let go of the only life she knows. You know, sometimes when you're out here, you just take, you'll take anything just to make, make the pain go away. It's not a nice way to find out, though, is it, from somebody else? No, it's, it's horrible. I'm hurting. Oh, yes, I'm hurting. For 25 long years, Sharon lived on these streets. No, not lived, existed. There are organizations striving to help people living with mental illness, but the problem is so overwhelming that too many people just end up back on the street, or worse, in jail. Some say the LA County Jail is the de facto biggest mental institution in the world. It's the evening muster at the Union Rescue Mission. They are people with nowhere else to go. It's scary to think how easy it is to slip off the edge in the United States. If you lose your job, then miss a few payments on the house, there's often not a lot standing between you and Skid Row. This is the first dinner session of the evening. They'll feed about a thousand people tonight. Um, first of all, it's the women, and then the men, and um, they also feed the families separately as well. There's a lot of mouths to feed. Up on the roof, it felt like a million miles away. The sun was still shining, and it was another beautiful LA sunset. Downstairs, they were setting up for the evening. Staff here at the rescue mission know they have the skills to help people back on track. People need to make a conscious choice to seek help. But if you have a mental illness, that choice isn't so clear. <laughs> 